Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon. And today we have a very special guest and friend on, and that is Diana Walsh-Pasolka. Diana is a, a religious scholar, an author, an academic. Uh, she's consulted on a lot of um, you know uh, important projects, both uh, uh, fictional and non-fictional. Uh, she's written academic papers. She is the author of uh, one of the most uh, popular books, I think, on the phenomenon in recent years, which has like it became an instant classic, which is American Cosmic. And uh, now she has added another volume, which um, to me is absolutely incredible. Um, and that's called in uh, Encounters, Experiences with Non-Human Intelligence, uh, Explorations with UFOs, Dreams, Angels, AI, and Other Dimensions. And yeah, you know, I'm going to say off the bat that that subtext is is highly important for I think people's understanding of the phenomenon, uh, because usually uh, when when you say UFO, it's a it's there's a, there's a a, a pre placed framework for what that means, and we're going to get into that aspect of of why that is. Um, but uh, welcome welcome to the show, Diana. I'm so thrilled to be on the show. It's been years, right? Yeah. So I've known I've known James for many years. Um, and you know, even before I think before American Cosmic came out, yeah, I think yep. I sent you. A, yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah. And um, so yeah, so it's great to finally be talking with you. Yeah, it was, it was funny how we began talking too. Uh, that was like a it had that had its own kind of synchronicity. Um, with the name engaging the phenomenon and all that. I know. I honestly thought that you had read that in that interview by Jacques Ballet. And, you know, I was like, wow, he, he saw that interview and he's, you know, he picked up the most important point and you didn't even know. <laughs> yeah, had I had I had no article. idea. <laughs> I, I had only seen the article when you sent it to me a few months ago. And the funniest thing is Jacques Vallée just published uh, Forbidden Science Volume 5. And in, in the beginning of the volume, which, you know, I guess he wrote in the 2000s, but it wasn't released until uh, maybe w within the past few months or year. And one of the, in, in the, in his actual writings, it says engaging the phenomenon. So that's right. It was like, that yeah. is so funny. Like just what are the odds, right? Um, I know. And that's, that's what clued me to like, okay, James is on a level like he's, you know, you know, there's some level that he's on that he's picking this stuff up because he didn't actually know that it was out there. I don't even think you had read Jacques Vallée at that point. No, I hadn't. I hadn't. I, I, I heard about him for many years and I just didn't get into his work. Um, but after I read your book, after I read American Cosmic, that's when it like clicked for me. Like I have to read Vallée, you know, because you were communicating some of his expressions and in, in your book. And, uh, and it, it just made total sense to me what you were saying. So, um, but again, I, I mentioned in, in your book, the subtext, um, you know, exploration with UFOs, dreams, angels, AI, and other dimensions. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, nowadays that, that conversation is more ready to be included into the, into the UFO subject rather than, um, you know, you hear UFO and then people automatically assume when you say UFOs, you're talking about, you know, metal disc crafts and, and extraterrestrials, um, you know, so-called aliens. So I thought it, it's really important that you, that subtext is included. Um, you know, but I, I did want to say that, you know, from an experiencer level, I, I, I highly recommend that everybody read the book because it spoke to me as a, as a person that had lived through that. So, yeah. and I think that in, in the book, you were really able to communicate the, the nuance and complexity that experiencers live um, in a way that I think somebody that had not experienced that can read that and have some idea. So I think that, you know, this is a, a very powerful book in that regard. So, so thank you for writing it. And uh, yeah. again, there's so many themes <laughs> that you included that are relevant and, and, and cutting edge. So, you know, thank you for that. Um, but, but let me just ask, begin with this, you know, how and why did you write this book? Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, American Cosmic was public, right? And at the same time, Leslie Kane, Ralph Blumenthal, and Helene Cooper published their 
um, exposés in the New York Times, like, you know, right, right as American Cosmic was in press. Um, so a lot of stuff happened right after that, that was really significant, obviously, for the topic of UFOs. And what I saw was I saw the formation of a public conversation about UFOs. And I knew that because I've now been doing this for so many years, right? I was thinking, okay, what's not being told in public? Like what's, you know, what are the things that are not being talked about? And so I, I recognized, because I had a huge amount of data, I recognized that Jacques Vallée had said this before. He said that if you are a researcher of this topic, the best thing to do is try to avoid the cases that are sensationalistic and getting a lot of press. He goes, can you guarantee there's going to be some kind of manipulation there? You know, go to those those people that are quiet about it. Those, you know, go to like, so I started with um, looking at indigenous cultures and their, you know, like uh, indigenous Australian culture and, you know, this idea that contact is an ongoing reality for a lot of cultures that are not like our Western culture. And I'm not the only person to have done this, like John Mack did this, his direct, the direction of his research was exactly this before he died. Like he was looking at indigenous African ideas of contact. And so, um, so I wanted to, to feature that, you know, the people that cultures, not just individuals, but cultures that talk about contact and, and what contact is like for them um, and then I wanted to feature the the variety of data shows that when people have these UFO experiences and they make quite an impact on them, they also have other things that happen to them as well. And these things are all related, but the, the question is why and how. So when I presented this, because um, I I'm working with an editor, and it's not the editor I worked with for Oxford because she had retired. Uh, so there was a new editor that was saying to me when he was reading it, he said, I'm not quite getting this. Like, what do you, you know, you're, you're dealing with like visions of St. Michael. You're talking about experiences that people have, like, you know, of the future and this and that, and there's even AI in there. Like, you know, what's going on? And I, and I told him, I said, if you're actually doing research, this is the data you get. You get data that shows that people are having these experiences of various paranormal, we call them paranormal, supernatural events, synchronicities, all of these things. And these things, you know, we have to go with the data. And I've learned that a lot, that even if it doesn't make sense, like in American Cosmic, there were several times when it just didn't make sense, but I left it in there. Like the rubble that I encountered at the crash site in New Mexico, uh, my editor at that time wanted me to take it out because she said it really doesn't make sense that, you know, the explanation that Tyler gave was that the U.S. government had put in a bunch of these cans, like tin cans, and they disintegrated into this rubble over the years uh, to deter people from, you know, using metal detectors to look for this debris. And she said, there's no way, you know, no way that's going to happen. And and you can't you have to take that out. And I said, I can't take it out. Even if it's not true what he told me, there's a reason why there's a bunch of rubble there. I don't know what the reason is, but it's data and I have to keep it in there. So um, now within light of the, the crash retrieval programs and things like that, well, now we know why that rubble was there, right? So, um, but we didn't know it then. So that's my suggestion to anybody who's doing this research is there will be things that don't make sense. And they will be embarrassing to talk about even, right? But you do have to keep them in because at some future point, we'll get why that data is there. Oh, James? Yeah, just because you mentioned the, the, the debris in the, um, in the field there. You know, one thing you do cover in the book is the, the perception management of of um this topic so uh, you know do you want to to explain you know what what that means the, the perception management 
of the UFO issue. And then uh, beyond that, some of the conversations you had with people and, and actually involved in that work. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so for those who do just do like six months of work in UFO research, um, they're going to notice that, you know, since the 1940s, the government has been engaged in trying to manage the public perception of UFOs. This is not a conspiracy. <laughs> this is something that's just fact. Um, we've had Project Blue Book and other projects, okay? Um, some were classified, some were not classified. Uh, Project Blue Book was not a classified prog uh, program. However, there were parts of it that were definitely not told to the public, okay? Um, like the, the background information and work with media in order to debunk certain sightings and things like that. We all know that that's the case now. Okay, we know that. Um, the tools of perception management, which were you know, public media back then were slow. Today, they're super fast, instantaneous. And so um, this, is, this is something that we have to keep in mind. So if any academics get into this topic they actually have to address this. And this is, academics do not like to address this part. It's really messy. It's really difficult to um, adjudicate what's being, you know, what you're told and what could be planted information. Um, but if we're going to do it responsibly, we have to do this because this is just the fact. This is just how, how it goes. So um, I think that part of American Cosmic for me was kind of a, um, uh, Whitley Strieber, I talked to him the other day and he called it an appall, like an appalled journey through the field of, you know, UFO reality. And I think it's true because I was as, as a normal academic who was doing uncontroversial work, I was appalled at the level of perception management involved, which is part of the, you know, um, part of the shock was, oh, whoa, you know, this never happened to me when I was doing Catholic history, right? So what happened then um, was that I did a lot more background research and looked at academics who'd studied, say, history of perception management in different communities, not just UFO communities, but in general, uh, history of like CIA and things like that. Um, during that time period, um, somebody asked me the other day on live stream, they said, Oh, we heard you were taking a break, you know, from from ufology, uh, and you know, what were you doing? And well, yeah, I was because it was uh, really an intense, an intense book to write, and then to live through the aftermath of it. And I did attract people from all over the world who are interested in this technology uh, for their own governments, back engineering it, you know, that type of thing. So. Um, and I was probably most likely, if we are to be honest, a target for people who wanted to utilize me as an interfacer with the public to either plant information <clears throat> that they wanted to get out or to use me as what's called a flypaper um, to attract. You know, So here I am. A lot of people are coming to me, wanting to work with me and do this kind of thing. And so, you know, I'm being, you know, my communications are being monitored so that, you know, people in United States intelligence or whatnot can see, you know, who's interested in this, you know, that, okay, that they might be bad actors who are interested in. So this all makes sense. This isn't something, um, you know, this isn't something that we could not expect. I mean, it's been going on. So what happened then was that I did meet people who were engaged in the public perception and managing and um and it was a strange experience for me <laughs> How, i mean what was the vibe you got from those people uh and like did they seem nefarious or did they were you know what what <laughs> what was their read what was your read on them if, if you if you don't mind sharing yeah um i have a chapter in the book chapter eight uh the children of the invisibles where I talk about my interface with the communities. And I actually knew some people who were children of the people in these programs. Um, one was a friend of mine, pre-UFO even. Um, her name is Patty Teresi, um, and she was a philosopher. Um, she retired since, since this. 
Um, but anyway, so I actually never understood her childhood ever. Um, and I don't think she did either until I actually started to write American Cosmic. And I learned about the people who were involved in these programs uh, because their lives are really constrained. And so I recognized then once I started to do that and I introduced her to some of the people and she started to recognize that her childhood was not a normal childhood. She already knew that, um, but she didn't know how. And so I was able to, to utilize her story because she agreed to interview um, in order to bring light to, you know, the presence of people like this. So you asked me a, a good question. What is their vibe, right? I found them to be extraordinarily intelligent. Um, I found them to be, have extreme powers of perception, right? Um, they, they were extremely educated, okay? And they were also, they had lives of, they lived in these, they lived quiet lives. Like they, they didn't, you know, they didn't want to cause attention to themselves at all, you know? Um, and, and um, I enjoyed, I enjoyed talking to them because they were interesting. Obviously they had a lot of history like that goes back to the United States even. And, um, and so I learned a lot and I was, I would say I was tempted to um to just leave everything behind leave my research behind you know and kind of you know go into a life like this because it seemed pretty affiliated and in um it was complementary to how I actually live as a professor as a professor generally people who are professors do the lifestyle like this because they are introverted um they like to observe things, you know, on the sidelines. They don't like to have a lot of attention, you know, that kind of thing. And this was, you know, an attractive lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. But for sure. Yeah. There was also some pretty terrible things about it too. And that's the recognition that they were doing, they were gauge just perception management that I didn't agree with philosophically. So this is when I had to make use, and I've said I've talked about this a lot on podcasts. Um I made use of my own training because, you know, I'm a, I'm a trained in the history of religions, but also in philosophy. I have philosophy training too. I'm not a, I don't have a PhD in philosophy, but I have, you know, I began as, as one. I began, began as a graduate student in philosophy and I've been reading philosophy since I was a kid. And so what came to mind to me was the allegory of the cave, you know, because in that, in the allegory of the cave, which is, uh, which is an allegory that Plato puts into a book that he writes about justice basically. And, um, you know, can we have a just society? It's called Plato's Republic. Um, honestly, never, I understood at a very basic level what that allegory was about. It's about, you know, it's kind of like a mate, the matrix you utilize it as a template. It's about, we live in a reality, but it's actually not really reality. You know, it's a simulation of reality. And some of us get out of it and you know try to tell others about it okay so that's kind of what the allegory talks about but what it what it really talks about is that there are these people that are like the puppet masters who are controlling the reality and this is what was really struck me as immoral and unethical <laughs> and i didn't i didn't that was no i just didn't like that and um so that was my, that was my vibe that, yeah, it's, I get it, you know, and some of them were saying, there's people who you tell, you know, that they're in the cave or whatnot, you know, uh, they don't actually care. And they, you know, and even Plato says it in, uh, in the allegory, he says, it, he uses Socrates to say it, but Socrates says, and if you go back and you tell the people in the cave, not only will they think you're crazy, they might even try to kill you. Okay, so there are these stark warnings, you know, of um, what happens. So, um, so yeah, so that was the vibe I got. Yeah, and, you know, the, you know, you, you talked a little bit of before in a sense, but I, th I think the, the, the biggest, the biggest um, conflict with, the, you know, that 
waking people up to to the cave anal- um, allegory is not, you know, in this regard, I don't think it's the non-human intelligence thing that's like, why it's so explosive. I think the biggest deterrence for people to be open to this information is to have the realization that they've been misled intentionally. Yes. And it gets that is it. to that Mark Twain quote. Um, I, I forget the exact quote, but it's, it's, it's always stuck with me is like, nobody wants to believe that they've been fooled. That's the essence of the quote. You know, it's, yeah. it's harder to convince somebody that they, that uh, they've been duped. Uh, this is the biggest challenge because that, you know, again, even with, with your background, religious, right. Religions, people's belief systems, you know, even in Western cultures uh, include, even, even if people sometimes don't take it literally, even though some, some people do um, angels and, you know, other non-human intelligence. So that's like, it's within our, our belief systems. But when you get to the realization that you've been intentionally misled by your institutions, then you, then at that point, it's like, it's a breakdown in, in in your belief structure of who what what you're supposed to believe because th- then you have to rewrite everything like what you have to it yep. can make you completely paranoid and distrustful and you can go through a whole period of a, a downward spiral um which which again is it could it, it's a you know you lose i guess you could say you people w- would lose their trust in institution coming to that realization um but if i can i say something about that yeah i absolutely okay so absolutely um i've been you know i'm a professor so i interface a lot with people in their young you know young people in their 20s um even teenagers and i have teenagers and i have a lot as a mom okay i have a lot of care for what's happening right now and what i see is that young people are are totally waking up to this Mm -hmm. and they're saying what you say too right now james they're saying you know it could disintegrate your trust in pretty much everything right um but i'd like to say this and i feel thankful that i started to study this when i was really young because now i can say to people and young people in particular wait people have figured it out and we actually have some some books that can help us right we have people like you know socrates was killed by his government for doing this for basically waking people up and the government was Athens and they accused socrates of being an atheist of all strange things i mean he was telling them about the mystical good you know that it actually exists and things like that so you know and he they told them he was corrupting the youth so they sentenced him to death. Now, Plato was his student, saw this, and was horrified by it. And thus, he wrote Plato's Republic and put the allegory of the cave in there to tell us that this is the structure of almost all societies. Now, I'm not going to say it, it's the universal structure, but it certainly is like the structure of Western societies. Is it for indigenous cultures? Probably not. No. That, you know, that that allegory could not be, it, you know, it's it's not universal, but it's certainly our experience. So, and you see this repeated in certain religions as well. So you see it repeated in um, in religions. Once religions become, you know, when they're young, when rebel, and I I I know that people in my field get angry when I say this, but when look when religions are young, often they're super revolutionary. So you've got you know Jesus basically saying the same thing he was actually called the socrates of you know that time period the first century and um, he was also killed by the government in which he lived by the romans right for treason against the government by the way that was the official chart and what he was telling people was basically yeah so you know yeah the government is like this and you know things look really bad and you know this is how we get out of it Right. He was he was creating like a what you and I know as a Sangha, a, a community of people. And he was saying, so bring this news to other people. But if they don't listen to you, don't sweat it. You know, of course, I'm paraphrasing, you know, don't sweat it. Leave the village and go to the next village where they're open to your message. 
So, I mean, if you, if you look at it through time, um, these, 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 um, we can see that people have told us how to deal with this situation and how to deal with it is this, this way that, um, that you found on your own, right? This work that you did as, as a young person and then came into these experiences of uh, direction, kind of giving you this life direction. Um, these are actual real things that happen. And this is what I wanted to show in encounters. I wanted to have person after person after person show, you know, as not telling you, but actually showing it through their life choices. Um, and their own experiences that they found this way. Like um, my student, Jose, right? Um, you know, was was a, on the front in Iraq. And, you know, he, because of what he lived through as a young person, literally a child, um, and then being sent to Iraq, his experiences, you know, which include UFOs, but those are just some of the experiences that they, that they include. He's able to negotiate and understand, you know, he's a young person to see what's happening right now. And he is an incredible, uh, I, what would I call it? He's a person who is able to talk to young people to make them see and, and to give them hope, you know, because he's, he went through that. He went through that, that process. Yeah. And, and again, in regards to the perception management, um, what are what are you think uh, tools or 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 paths people can use to navigate perception management in regards to the UFO phenomenon and uh, if you want to generalize as well? Yeah. Okay. So this is where I talk about discernment. Okay. So discernment is a term used in the Christian, Catholic religion, Orthodox use it, and it's this this idea that you actually do have a connection to knowledge like a spiritual knowledge but it has to be trained this is a this is a process called discern okay where will you discern you know what's going on here um is this a good act for me to do or a bad act you know what kinds of things will happen from it but basically it's more of a an idea of a gnostic knowledge um and when i when i call it gnostic i'm not referring to some of the traditions in the first century or second century before the common era of um where you know there's like a dualist framework of good and evil i'm not referring to those traditions i'm referring to the actual word gnostic knowledge uh which is redundant but it's a greek word that means um a special type of knowledge and it's a special type of knowledge that i i discuss with my students i tell them when we talk about what what is gnosticism um so you'd have you know a chocolate bar right and you can read the ingredients about how what that chocolate bar, and that's the information about the chocolate. So that's a form of knowledge about it. Or you can eat it, and that would be Gnostic knowledge. So Gnostic knowledge is an experience of what the thing is. And so discernment involves this, like tuning into this experience. Um, and it is taught in many traditions. It, it's taught in a lot of religious traditions. They'll have different names for it, but it's it's this this thing. Now, that said, it's it's hard to, uh, to it's hard to develop. I wouldn't say that I'm really great at it, but I'm doing my best. And I think that um, some people are just naturally a lot better than me at it. And um, and if you have friends like that, they're good friends to have. <laughs> a lot of times, you can do discernment in communities. Of people, I always suggest that one way to deal with the perception management is to use your discernment to determine like who are, who's giving you BS and who's not, you know, that there's the thing called the BS detector. Um, that's, a, that's like discernment. That would be a, a, a modern way of describing discernment. And um, just one last thing on, on perception management. Do you, um, to what level do you think that the, the current UAP conversation now um has has um implements of perception management um well that would implicate me okay <laughs> right that would put me in a position where like you know i'm already in but you know um i would say that let's just assume that there's going to be some perception management 
I'm not going to say how much I don't actually know, but yeah. I would say, you know, use your discernment here. Okay. And, um, yeah, let's, 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 uh, shift the discussion. Cause there's, there's so many different themes in the book that we can go on. It's, um, I don't think we're going to be able to get to everything. Um, which is, which is a good thing. I think, I think, um, and I thought it was so great that you read the book as well, you know, that, uh, that you oh, narrated thanks. it, it is, you have such a super cool voice. Um, sometimes when people are, can, you know, an audio book, like I could just like, uh, I'm going to fall asleep to this, but you're like, voice is very, uh, vital, <laughs> right? Vitality. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you. Well, the reason I wanted to do it is because I wanted to emphasize certain things and the voice contains information. And I you really got... wanted this. Okay. Yeah. So, let's shift to that really quick. What do you mean by that? Okay. So, you know, we've lost this ability or we, we still have it, but we don't think about it that the voice is a conveyor of information like sound, right. It conveys information. And, um, I know that if I say a paragraph about an ex person that I'm, you know, talking about an experiencer that I'm getting what they're saying. And a lot of times these experiencers, like let's take Dr. Ea Whiteley. Yeah. He's a, he's a genius. And it's very difficult. This kind of like with people in American Cosmic too, who are the geniuses, it's really difficult to translate. The, if you just let her go in a, a group that doesn't have any like training in space research and stuff, they'll not understand what she's, she's just telling them. So there's like, I kind of function as a translator for these people that are just on the very innovative cutting edge. I mean, they're so out there. Sometimes they even speak just in math. And it's like, whoa, you, you know, I'm like, bring it down to a level that I can understand it. And then I translate it. And part of that translation are the inflections and things in my voice. And so that I really wanted to convey this information to the people that need to hear it. And a lot of times I feel like if you get a narrator, they're good and they, they tell the information, but it's not the Gnostic information that's being conveyed. It's not like the, you know, like what we had just talked about. Yeah. Cause then you even got into that in the book a little bit. Um, it, 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 I, I, I believe it's called cryptography or. Yes. Yeah. To, so you... that, yeah, that's really interesting. So again, it's not just so we think of cryptography in terms of the types of, you know, like um, code. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it makes sense. Okay. You need certain code in order to fit where this code, where it needs to go in order for the system to work like algorithmically or whatnot. But we don't tend to think of our voices like code and we don't tend to think of even our characters like code, but what if they function that way? So some of the data that I found, even going back historically, is that when people have these experiences and they happen to be positive ones, um, kind of like spiritually transformative even, um, the people are on a set, they have a very similar character. Um, and I put you in this category, actually, James. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you've got a good character. You're a good person, okay? And so than me, okay? I have a, a good character. I try try to do good things, right? But I'm not the kind of I'm not that kind of person. Like, um, I have a a little brother who's a good person, and he's, he has these experiences, or he had these experiences, um, extremely has a lot of integrity just you know and so when you look back at say joseph of copertino the saint who is said to have levitated and he's had all these experiences he's described in the same way he's described in the same way and so you look back at the religious traditions you see francis of assisi he's also described that way um so there's a lot of information about character so it made me consider as i was working with people like simone who's doing ai and she's talking about you know, she's actually doing cryptography, right? And so, um, but she's saying that that voices are cryptographic. They work that way. Your the sounds in your voice. Um, but you, so so I looked at it and I thought, you know, I think character does that too, because and I I actually did have conversations um, with Tyler of American Cosmic about this too, because a lot of times people would want to access the information that he was able to access. 
And he would do his best to try to help them, but they couldn't do it. And finally, I, I asked him, I said, why do you think they can't do it? And he said, I think it has to do with like their intention and they just don't, they want it for the wrong reason. They just don't want it for it, intrinsic goodness. Like they don't, you know, they just, and I'm not saying he's a good guy, but he's got some kind of, um, you know, he'd do a lot of things that were good and um, helping people and such. Um, and if you if you showed him what was the way that was good, like, you know, presented like, oh, this person, you know, um, there was a uh, an example of a child who was in a deficit situation and he, you know, fixed the situation. He put into place these things to fix the situation just because that's that was what should be done. Not because right. he had any kind of like feeling like, yeah, I want to do this. He did it just as like, almost like cryptographically. That's what I've noticed. And I don't know if, if this makes sense to people, but this is what I'm beginning to see. I, I when I um, was reading that and listening to that, I, that was like, I had like an epiphany kind of thing. I was like, wow, yeah, that makes sense. Um, it, it's deep, it's deep. But again, it, it that's, this kind of stuff you're going to come across um, in this uh, when you're talking about these. Uh, I don't. I don't know. What the, I don't. I don't know if I could say advanced or innovative. It's. It's. Um, I don't know. It's. It's. It's deep. You know. That's the best way I can put it. You know. And I think that there's it's, something. Yeah, it's definitely a way that we don't actually think about knowledge or anything like that, right? We just, you know, we don't use any categories to think about it that way. Uh, but once you're hit with this data again and again and again, it sinks in finally. You're like, whoa, maybe it works like this. Yeah. So, you know, since since you mentioned Ia, I, you know, you you start the book off. Um do you do you want to get a little bit into her background and um what yeah. the work that she's doing, uh, which is fascinating. It's like so innovative, it's like really cool too. So do you want to explain a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, so Dr. Ia Whiteley is head of space research at Mollard Space Laboratory, I think it's called, at University College London. And she helps uh, train astronauts for going into space. Um, there's a field called space psychology. And I believe she may be one of the first space psychologists, if not, not the kind of the creator of that field. Um, so, she is an in, she's fascinating, um, really an interesting person, and uh, so she's part of a group of people that I I've met who do who are affiliated with space programs and do aviation and aerospace research, um, but they they very they are very clear that that they do UAP work in their spare time. Okay, so let's just say it. So she does this in her spare time. <laughs> it's not affiliated with the organizations that she works for. Okay. That said, um, what she's doing is part of what she does is when astronauts go out into space, they experience different states of, of mind that human beings aren't used to ever experiencing, right? And the farther they get away from Earth, these are highly trained individuals, right? To be an astronaut, you go through so much incredible training that they might not even recognize that they're having, say, a panic attack or something like that. And in fact, Dr. Whiteley, she told me, don't even call it that, Diana, please don't call it a panic attack. They do not have those. And I was like, all right. <laughs> but she said that she has this technology that she's developed in order to ascertain if they're having this kind of uh, fear response or a response that could be, that could jeopardize the mission. Okay, so they're farther away from, from Earth and they're feeling, they get a feeling that um, it's not the ultra view effect, which people have identified as looking at Earth from space and you're like, wow, this amazing thing. Uh, you know, how many people get this perspective? And so it's like this kind of transformative perspective. But no, they're not having that. They're having like something that is, it, it is they're experiencing that, it, it, that 
one of the astronauts said, it's like my body is a sensing instrument for all of humanity. And now it's out here and I feel really vulnerable, <laughs> you know? And so this is, so she has technology that then identifies if, you know, and then they put into place ways to help them while they're in space. As she's doing this, she's utilizing that technology for her spare time research, which is basically hammering out um, uh, a way, a very practical and operational way to understand languages that we've not, or at least our culture hasn't been able to understand, like um, what she calls earth languages. So these could be, you know, the language of dolphins, whales, um, you know, uh, even certain kinds of plants and things like that. And she said there's, uh, what she does is she uses the technology to then um, translate these patterns, which she calls our languages, into um, audio and graphemes, like the these graphemes. And she says that if we can share this language with babies, because the baby's brains are making neural you know, they're uh, creating networks uh, up till about six months or nine just, months. You said, oh, go ahead. What is what is a graphing? Okay, so the graphing is going to look like um, it's a physical code. It's, um, it's a pictorial image, kind of like a hieroglyph of the sound, right? And it has information in it. And... Um, and it's beautiful, by the way. It looks kind of like each one looks kind of like a snowflake. So yeah. for each sound, these are really beautiful. Um, you know, it has a structure that makes sense, but you wouldn't, you and I wouldn't know it. But she explains why and how it makes sense. So she's basically um, now her her goal is to allow humans is to create um, to foster young people that can be more accessible to um, non-human intelligences that, you know, we can then, you know, if we can learn to speak with our own environment, right, in ways that we had, we didn't have before, um, that will help us uh, in the future to be, uh, well, she thinks it's going to help the planet, like people, right, um, just communicate with each other in a less aggressive way. But also, we're going to understand and I know a lot of scientists are actually working on this right now is using AI to kind of crack the code of like whale languages and, and things like that. I mean, we're really at truly an interesting time in our history of humans. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the dolphin and whale thing too is, um, is, is I thought really interesting. Um, you know, cause you know, kind of like a side note into the, the contact aspect. I know people that were, had been experiencers, that had i guess you can say experimented or that you know they've done expeditions where they're they're trying to do communication with um with dolphins you know i guess non-human intelligence through contact modalities yes yeah so yeah. i thought that was interesting um but and she I, by the way she she's the person who who practices what she preaches she is a uh an award-winning skydiver uh, she puts herself into extreme spaces. Uh, she swims with dolphins uh, regularly and attempts communication with them. Um, she actually does what she, she's not one of these researchers that kind of sit in their office and do this. No, she's like out there she's and the, doing it. How does how does she attempt to do the communication with the dolphins? She swims with them. Yeah. And the funny, again, the funny thing is I know of experiencers who have done that work and, and people in the intelligence community. So <laughs> right, go figure. Uh, so yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and you know, I, 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 yeah, there's, there's so much from the book I wanted to get to the, the idea of, of, uh, the UFO or UFOs as a hyper object. So can you can you explain what yeah. what that means? Yeah. So okay, so a hyper object is an I okay, so it's an object that either 
in our own dimension, if it's a 3D object, it's so large, like Jupiter or something like that, that's so giant that when we look at it, we can't see it in its totality, right? So we can't, it's, um, so in a sense, it, it exceeds our conceptions, right? Because it's so giant or it's a virtual object that is, that we're able to identify through, well, today, uh, through computer modeling, you know, know that these kinds of objects exist, like uh, what we call like fourth dimensional objects and things like that. And um, so in, in terms of um, using that category, this is a category that's now um, people are utilizing uh, like Dr. Jim Madden is, is just wrote a book about uh, the UFO as a hyper object. And I believe that other people have, have discussed this too. Um, but I know I, I do in, in this book. Um, so, so this is a category for first off where we're at as, you know, where we've come in terms of like, we we're now off the planet. We're into space where we're going to be engaged with, you know, things that are just enormous, like space itself just conceptually uh, difficult to, for us to, to put our, you know, put our brains around. Um, and then virtually going into spaces where, you know, it, virtual spaces. So we're in these two different spaces where we've never been before at the same time, by the way. And so, um, so I'm talking about this in terms of what does this mean for, for us kind of like as a, as a species, right? Uh, if you think about it, when when we have different technologies, like in the creation of the printing press and the book and things like that, it actually changed the ways in which we thought of ourselves as human beings. Like, um, and uh, this guy named Walter Benjamin, who is a philosopher um, of the twenty early twentieth century, he actually does does talk about this, and 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 he's right. So he says, you know. Now we have this thing back in the day called the telescope where we're able to look up into space, whereas before it was a communal tribal experience. When you look up into space and you see the beautiful stars and it's an ecstatic experience with your tribe and community, your family, he goes, now it's this solitary experience, right? Like the book was that way too. Whereas you, you know, you had experienced knowledge as this oral tradition passed down through grandparents and parents and things like that. Now all of a sudden you have this thing that's a book you can't actually read a book as a community, right? Unless you all read it, you're having a solitary experience with this knowledge, right? So um, so we're in this new phase. I don't know how, what's going to happen to, I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna pretend that I can project and say how it's going to impact us. I can only say that here we are and these people that I'm, I'm interviewing in this book, they're, they've been thinking about it too. They've already been on the other side. And this is what they have to say about this. And what they have to say, I mean, a lot of them are incredibly hopeful. Some of them are not, but a lot of them are hopeful. And they see this as a time of knowledge expansion for people who, you know, that who, uh, let's take Simone. Um, Simone is an innovator in AI. She's like, you know, uh, been doing that for a long time. And she, she often utilizes the, example of the French Revolution to talk about when knowledge was provided to the people finally, like when they demanded it and angrily took it because they knew that they weren't allowed to read. You know, they didn't have the, they didn't have the knowledge. They didn't have what they wanted. Um, and they knew that that knowledge could help them. So Simone says that there's a lot of doomer narrative about AI that she says we shouldn't have that, especially those of us of the 99%. Because the bankers have been utilizing AI um, to create trillions and trillions of dollars uh, for their communities. And we don't have that information. And we're finally getting it. And we should jump at the opportunity because this is knowledge expansion for us. And it can only be good is what she's saying. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, so what I'm trying to do, like I said, I'm not making any projections about what's happening. I'm just saying we're here. And these are what some of the most innovative people have to say about it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just just um, a kind of little side riff in, in regards to AI. Um, and and I know, you know, we're talking about UFOs, but you have AI and then you have the idea of um, transhumanism, 
right? Um, it's kind of part of that conversation. And, you know, I guess there's there's probably some speculation. And again, this is a complete like side tangent thing, but of this, like the gifting fields, right? You have the gifting fields of, of planted or seeded technology um, as a potential uh, Trojan horse, right? Of us finding this and developing this technology that is, uh, you know, some some form of of non-human intelligence intelligence is trying to guide us down a particular path of development. Um, that that uh, yeah, in in one way or another, right? Because there's the, that's a whole conversation. Um, but I'm I'm interested in in your kind of thoughts. Have you heard anything in regards to that uh, to that idea? Um, yeah, af- uh, definitely, of course. So you know the whole idea of you know because I, I I go I open American Cosmic with going to the donation site, right? This uh this place that I don't believe when I was in you know that was many years ago. I I just didn't believe it. I was like. How do these guys believe this? They're really smart. Why are they thinking that, you know, there was a crash here? So I, I went with them. And um, now, of course, the, these places are in the news, right? They're, you know, the crash retrieval places. So um, I did think about that at, the, at that time. I was like, they're so hopeful, you know, to think that this is like a gift of some sort. Like, why would they think that? So I don't, so that's just, you know, I don't know. So, but then again, it seems like if you look at the work that like, you know, those two scientists do now, like helping people recover from cancer and things like that, you know, it it certainly seems like, you know, a gift for sure. uh, The kinds of uh, technologies that were inspired um, there. So, so there's that, but there's also, once I started to do this research, some of the information I looked at was actually by uh, Stephen Dick, who's a an astronomer and a historian. And he's been the NASA official historian for about 40 years. I think he's retired now. And um, and his work is fascinating because it was many, many years ago. He speculates about, and by the way, he's one of the founders of both exobiology and astrobiology, two fields that are out there in space looking for life, extraterrestrial intelligent life, habitable planets, you know, these kinds of things. Um, so he speculates about when we meet ET, you know, he suggests that it's going to be what he calls post-biological. Right, exactly, um, Simone, yeah. So, yeah, and Simone wouldn't call it post-biological because she says that that has this idea that there's like an, a before and after kind of, you know, she says that has temporal connotations. And she she doesn't speak in space time and um, space time language. I mean, she doesn't use like temporal, you know, timeline, um, which is a challenge then to talk with her because you're like, whoa, because she blows your mind every time, um, you know, just by the language that she uses. Um, but he, he did. He uses temporal ideas, but he's talking about the same thing. Basically, what he's saying is he says, if you conjecture our own society and you say that, OK, we have not say let's look a thousand years into the future let's just assume that we've gotten over the the strange drive to eradicate ourselves with weapons okay and we've we've somehow progressed beyond that and now we're technologically advanced we're on the moon or on mars or you know we've got these kinds of space things going on he says the only way we're going to do that is if we actually augment ourselves um technologically, biotechnology. <clears throat> and if we can assume that we've done that, and if there are ET races, species that are beyond that point, we're going to assume that they've achieved some level of technological development where they they're, they're, they appear to be like gods, right? They appear to be like deities. Like they have powers that we just can't imagine. Think of the things that we're doing now that a thousand years ago, we couldn't even imagine doing those. So um, he's just suggesting that this is the, this is going to be what it's like. So, yeah, so I was introduced to his ideas, you know, 20 years ago. And I have seen like 
And he's, by the way, he's reworking those ideas now uh, based on current, the current state of AI. Yeah. And, you know, again, this, this, um, will maybe fall into the category of religion or religious belief is that there's, um, there's certain trains of thought like, okay, you know, maybe one intelligence is trying to gear us towards a certain direction of development. And another saying, and, and another is trying, another kind of intelligence is trying to direct us in a different direction. And the idea that, okay, if, if we, um, you know, put those, you know, that kind of post biological uh, worldview into effect, that it, it, you know, essentially would, would cut our connection to source. Um, our ability to connect with the organic field of information. Yeah. yeah, yes. And this is a huge emphasis in the book, the organic network, Yeah. right? That predates the internet. Yes. And that a lot of the people in the book feel and, and believe that they're in contact with and connected to. So this idea, and there's a, a Jesuit priest, philosopher, anthropologist, <laughs> uh, Tellier de Chardon, right? So he is this, um, he's of the early 20th century, and he had experiences when he was a soldier on the front during World War One. I. I think it was World War One, yeah. And so he went into an like almost like a, a, a transcendent state where he saw that, what was coming. And he said, ah, I, I know, he called it the newest sphere, right? Yeah. Like the sphere of knowledge. And he said that it's here already. <laughs> And we're going to be hooking into it in an actual way. So he, in a sense, like saw what was what was coming. It's like you know, early early twentieth century. So um, so a lot of people in the book, it, like who, some of those who don't even know this guy, um, are talking in a language very similar to this kind of um, a sphere that they uh, of knowledge that they feel like they can feel too. They don't just. They don't just think that their mind is connected to it. They feel like they it's almost like a um a frequency shift, like they could feel it, you know, it's like a buzzing to them. Um uh Len in the later part of the book, uh two chapters are devoted to his experiences, and he he definitely feels this as, as a real kind of force. And um, you know, so he grew up in the 1950s and 60s, so he you know, he predates the internet too, you know, so he, he felt it as this, this force. I thought it was really interesting, his experience, and I really wanted to share it, uh, as it's not just a UFO experience that happened to him. That was actually, it's actually in, uh, you, it's in Wonders in the Sky, which is the reference book that Jacques Vallée created. And it's a 1967 account that more than 30 credible witnesses saw in different parts of, of upstate New York, Brockport. Um, in the 1960s and so he had an actual legitimate experience you know and then from there all these other things happened to him yeah yeah and that's um again that's like akin to you know people that have experiences it's you know it's more than just a ufo experience it's it's there's um post contact effects you can call it um which i, I believe jacques Vallée had written about uh, and, you know, actually with that too, um, that gets a bit into the, uh, the dream aspects as well. So did you want to talk a little bit about the, the gray man? Sure. So the gray man, again, is a person who works, um, had, you know, affiliations need needed to have the, uh, the plausible deniability Although I know you probably just are the best researchers on the planet. So somebody asked me the other day, you know, did, didn't you think that, of course, you know, Gary was and Tyler and now Gray Man are going to be known? And yeah, yeah. You know, but um, and and I know, you know, I tell them too, but they're like, no, no, have to have a pseudonym. Um, Simone too, by the way. So um, anyway. So he, so what's fascinating, not just about him, but also about Jose and also about Len, is that they're having dreams and they're, they don't call them dreams, right? So we would call them dreams because we only have 
in our lexicon, in our like way of discussing these things, we talk about, oh, I had a dream. It was either a good dream or a nightmare. And I have waking life, right? So there's no variation of dream. Whereas if you go to some cultures, like Tibet, there's like a Tibetan uh, Buddhist uh, community that actually has dream, like uh, dream experiences that they then codify into different types of dreams. They say, okay, yeah. well, this was this type of dream, that type of dream. We don't have that language. So when people have these kinds of dreams in our culture, they don't know what to make of them. They just say this. They say, that dream was not a dream. Like, but they know that it was an altered state of consciousness. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is people are having altered states of consciousness. They don't know if they're waking or they're dreaming, but it's very real to them. And sometimes they get information like precognitive information and that they can then verify, right? And, um, and they're confused. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to share these because I, I met so many people who got really confused by this and didn't understand what was happening to them. And I felt like they needed to know that this is actually a thing and that people do experience them. Don't be afraid. Um, and you know, this is how these people got through it. So, so gray man had these experiences in his dreams, he even had a dream, you know, of the grays and he had a dream that, well, he called them that he said that, you know, he, and um, he has, um, you know, some kids that require um, help, right? Extra help, you know, getting dressed and that kind of thing. And so he said that one night they both woke up and their clothes were on, not just backwards, but they were button up clothes and, and inside out. And he, <laughs> he didn't put them on that way. And the child wouldn't have been able to do it anyway, wouldn't have been able to take it off or put it back on. So, um, so you know, this is not a typical dream, okay? And um, this is where I did some um, research into the, uh, the dream time. Uh, we call it the dream time, but in Australia, it's a, it's a really amazing worldview that they have. And they actually, the dream time provided so much information to me about other cultural ways of looking at dreams when dreams are weird like that for us. We say they're weird, but in these cultures, this is a normal dream. So people would have dreams that had actual physical effects or where you know a woman's dreaming of her father who's, who's died and she's in her home dreaming this. And she, the dream is that she's at the graveyard at his grave and um, you know she's, she's talking to him. And then when she wakes up, she actually has um, dirt in her, you know, clothes and stuff, her bed clothes that are from that place. Like she didn't go to that place. It was far away. So, you know, these kinds of things we wonder how, you know, it, that's impossible. These things aren't possible. Yet these people are having these experiences. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, you, you mentioned dream time method. I believe I heard it as like the Aboriginal dream time and uh, Tibetan dream yoga, you know, and there's, right. there's yeah. actually, um, you know, there's a few books out there that you can get uh, that, that discuss, you know, how, if you even wanted to, you can do a practice that will help facilitate those states uh, for, for people who are interested in that. But again, you know, disclaimer, cause you don't, you don't know where you're going to go essentially. Yeah. Um, but if you're somebody who's already having these experiences, there there's ways that you can, you know, cultivate, um, you know, skills to to deal with that more skillfully. So I'm you know I'm just putting that out there as well. Um, you know, I I also wanted to discuss. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, briefly in the book, you know, hermeneutics. So, uh, I want the idea of her hermeneutics in, with within the the context of UFOs. Yeah, so hermeneutics is uh, interpretation. So, may tell me which specific part, and I'll I'll talk about it. Well, in a general sense, like how can that be applied to um, the UFO experience? Yeah. Okay. Good. So in the field, not just of religious studies, but in a lot of academic fields, um, we, we have like 
systematic ways of doing interpretation of things. Um, I use this these ways of interpreting angel contact events before I even thought of UFOs. And so um, part of that is the process of, of looking at what you call like the original sources of things. Um, because, you know, by the time, like say angel events get to us, and by the way, I have to tell you that it is challenging to talk not just about UFOs, but also religion for the fact that not only do people have preconceived notions of UFOs, they completely have preconceived notions of angels and things like that. So I have to be the bad guy and I have to say, you know, especially if they've had like a really um, conservative background and they believe, you know, contact events with the angels have always been such a wonderful transcendent experience. And then they tell them that, wow, it's actually terrifying. And sometimes these angels like hurt people and things like that. And they're like, whoa, what? You know, I'm blasphemous. So I have to be the bringer of this bad news. So um, so what do we do when we look at these, these events? Um, we're not just looking at what we've accepted, like, you know, especially if you're looking at art of angel events, uh, they look so good, they look so pretty, right? And then when you scratch the surface and you actually read the primary source, that's usually in some really, you know, old language, you have to find a person who can translate it if you can't. And then you have to get different people to do it so you can get, you know, different takes on, because the translation is not a perfect uh, type of thing. This is a hermeneutical problem too, a problem of interpretation. You know, I'll translate it one way, another person will translate it another way. So it's better to have as many translations as possible to compare them. And then you can kind of get to, well, this person was terrified and they received wounds from this angel that dealt with them harshly. And I'm talking about a really famous angel contact event that almost everybody who's Christian knows about. Um, and you could, you know, Google it. And there it is. And it looks really kind of cool, but it, it, it wasn't cool for that person. Um, all right. So that said, there are other ways of getting information. And this is what I learned when I was doing my research into purgatory, because a lot of the research I did was in, was for, in was Irish stuff, right? Um, and Ireland is a country that had been colonized by England. And so a lot of their history had been forcibly, almost intentionally, well, intentionally eradicated, right? So how do you then go back and, and look at a tradition that's, that's been under this stress? Um, we have to look at folklore and you have to look at oral tradition. And you have to look at, you know, stories that are passed down in songs from that time period and things like that. Like I learned so much from my dad and my grandparents who had an Irish background and, you know, my great grandparents literally came here from Ireland or uh, one of them. I, what, I knew certain things about the country and about the history that nobody else would know who wasn't Irish because they didn't inherit those songs. They didn't inherit that, you know, those, those traditions. So it's, those types of sources that people have to pay attention to, especially when they do ufology, because at one point, a lot of the classified data, and I'm not suggesting anybody be, you know, want to be privy to classified data, but we're talking about just basic history of like 40 years ago or, or you know, um, that would, that was destroyed. And it was, it was carried into the present through people. So there's an oral tradition of UFOs of our country and not just our country. There's an oral tradition of UFOs that gets passed down that people can't find. You know, they always want to get these documents that are then fully redacted, right? And you right. can't read them because, it, but did you know that there's actually people that have all that information? So, you know, there's an oral tradition and that's what I think uh, um, like people in my field would see it or anthropologists that do field research. They're like, You've got to be in those communities in order to get that information. And when, or when lucky. You, when you say that you um you mean they're being read into a program and they're being given the oral history um of of you know what uh yeah yeah. So they're read yeah. into a program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like so a, we're always looking for the documents, you know. Like I had a lot of like wealthy people want to reverse engineer this stuff and they're like, but where's the documents? And I'm like there are only communities of people like, you know, it's, you're either in that community of people or you're, or you're not. And they're not going to share with you unless you have, unless you're like Reddit, you know, unless you get, 
Um, and by the way, some of them are, some of these communities are like, it goes through family lines too. Uh, not all. But that's certainly what I found like within, you know, that you can see that in chapter eight of the book, that there are families of people that like, you know, it's very similar to like I was talking about my Irish roots connection. It's very similar to inheriting these oral traditions of a, a long thousand year old, more than that history. And that's something that sometimes can only be imparted through um communities of families really yeah and i guess that, that gets into some of the the legacy programs i think so i mean i didn't know that language legacy program until of course the last two years when it's been talked about but it seems to me that i ran across people like that in american cosmos you know there's there's crash retrieval going on there's reverse engineering going on there's people that are associated with programs, you know, you could call them legacy programs. They seem yeah. to be going on for a long time. Legacy. <laughs> That's what and, a legacy is. Exactly. So I uh, did so uh, um I guess you you would uh, may have encountered people within those programs. Um did do you think that people within those programs want to want some of this information out or do you think that they are in the the idea frame of like it has to be kept secret. I think there's both types in this program. Uh, I know for a fact that some of them are like, heck yeah, like we just need this out there. And yeah. then there, there's some people that are uh, like the ones I said, you know, like the people Perception. won't care anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they won't care anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Do you think that ultimately it, it is going to be that? Um, a good deal of the information is going to come out and then you know it in that respect with the perception management running its course how how could people tell the difference yeah that's exactly it so right. i mean it's so well orchestrated right there's okay but let me let me suggest this that the reason there's more transparency now is because there has to be all right, right. because there's going to be anyway and when I say that, what I'm referring to is that for the 20th century, right, uh, you know, really actually the 20th century, because before the 40s, there were rocket labs and things like that, right? So, okay. Um, during this time period, it was us in Russia, and we had the viable space programs. We were the, we were the ones that were able to get out into space off planet. So we were together in this, right? And we were aligned. And when I spoke to people from, you know, these programs, Russia programs and people from the American programs, they said, oh, yeah, you know, we have there's politics on the ground, you know, where but when we're in space, we're together. Right. Well, now you have other countries in space. You have China going into space. So, you know, you have a lot of things that are in space that are going to be looked at, discovered. Um, so it's a lot. The, uh, it's more information is way more permeable. So there has to be the more transparency. Just it has to be right now because, you know, they've got to come clean now, right? Not not entirely, but at least with, you know, because, you know, what happens if China sees some things and, and says to their people, well, you know, this is the case. And here in the United States, we're going to say, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know if I heard you mention it before or some or somebody else or I had read about it on online is that like th there's even AI technologies that are able to decode um, redacted documents and, and whatnot. That's or, right. Are going yeah. to be able to. Yeah, that's right. So I think I think I made you take a course of mine. <laughs> Sometimes I just put people into my courses, um, my, that UFO course uh, from like two years ago or something like that. Um and if you didn't know, you were in the course. So, um, and I talk about redaction in that course. And I spent a lot of time talking about it and what we do in my field, because I knew based on my, you know, talks with say Simone and other people in those communities that the, that these, they were, they were actually going to be finding out, you know, a reverse redaction, basically. They were gonna be utilizing AI for re reverse redaction. Whereas 
we in my field, that's what we were trained to do. We're not good at it though. We, you know, try to redact these, you know, first century codex documents. It's really hard, it's not impossible, but that's what we were attempting to do. Um, so now thinking of AI is like a thousand times better than a human at doing this. So yes, so I think it was Drew um, on Twitter from North Carolina or, or Matthew, one or the other, he basically posted something about these um, reverse redaction AIs. And that, that was what was coming. Yeah, I think I'd seen that on on um, somewhere. Um, but, you know, I I also wanted to talk about um, Tyler's uh, hierarchy or, or taxonomy of, of different intelligences. Because I found that really interesting. And what uh, was really interesting, too, is that uh, Monsignor Balducci... Uh, was you know he was open about the UFO subject and that he was speaking to UFO researchers and uh, that had come up and he had given his kind of opinion which actually is a little bit similar to to, to Tyler's uh, outlook. yes yes so, that these were beings that were higher on the kind of like this hierarchy of beings which you know not in terms of dignity of life but in terms of like just advanced civilization, advanced communities, you know, these kinds of things. So Tyler prepared this for students in my several of my classes. And um, I shared this in some of the classes that I teach. And um, and it does accord with Balducci's taxon taxonomy as well, which is really interesting because Tyler had no idea about Balducci at all. Um, and so he his uh, taxonomy is that there's a god, right? And then there are these angels. And then there are off-planet intelligences, ETs, right? And then below that, there are what he calls certain factions, not all, certain factions within the intelligence community, and then humans. Okay, so that's his, I think I got it right. That's his taxonomy, his yeah. pyramid of being. Why does he put the in, the intelligence community above? like in between <laughs> yeah that's what i wanted to know um i was like wait a minute um i think because he believes it i think that he thinks that they're um i mean i'm only so there are a lot of things that when i look back i wish i could have asked him yeah i think i was in so much shock at the time of just learning all this information that I, some of those questions that it just didn't occur to me, but you'd think that that would be one, right? Because I mean, I remember looking at it, but then I also knew that just based on his life, that of course he's going to think that way because his life is just not like everyone else's life. And the people that he, you know, engages with, they're, li they're also not, you know, like normal people. And to me, it made sense at the time. But when I look back on it, I'm thinking, Wow, when, especially when I'm looking back and I'm writing encounters, I'm actually, I resuscitated a lot of those PowerPoint presentations that he created. And I went back and I was blown away at the things he told me because it was only in light of what's happening now in Congress that I was like, oh my God, like this, he was telling me pretty much everything back then. And I wasn't processing it all at once because I think that it was a defense mechanism you know, and I was like, I was doing the best I could, but, um, but he was telling me that, you know, they're going to become us through technology and things like that. And I'm like, what does that even mean? And it doesn't sound good, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So these are the kinds of things I wish I could ask him now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought, I think it was brought up one time, um, that, uh, you said something along the lines of in intuition is the filter for truth. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So um, there's a famous poet, Robinson Jeffers from the like 1940s, 50s and 60s. And his poetry is really amazing. Um, he lived in um, California on the coast and he was, uh, he, he liked to talk, uh, do poetry about like a lot of different things but he's the one that basically clued me in now I, I learned about him when I was in college so you know I mean my I'm 20 
reading this. And one of the things, one of his, one line from one of his poems, which I can't remember which poem it is, um, but it basically is that if you catch intuition fresh, it will provide you with like truth, right? But once you start to give it some thought and to, to overthink it, basically, it loses its ability to tell you. So I think he's talking about precognition. I think he's talking about getting information, you know, when it just like hits your brain, like, and Tyler used to talk about that. So part of his protocol um, process was to be super receptive to this type of knowledge that he would call the download because that's what it felt like to him. It would just go boom in his head. Um, and this was, you know, and I think that that's really important because the students, my students really wanted to learn how he did this. And so he, being a, a nice man, you know, was basically trying to help them, you know, because they wanted to know and he thought that it could help them in their lives. So he was giving them lessons on how to identify it. And he identified as this kind of thought. And that reminded me of the Robinson Jeffers poem that I had read and I didn't quite get, but I was like, there's something to that that seems right. And so I remembered it um, all this time. Yeah. And you know, one thing I wanted to get to that I, I mentioned completely on the side was, um, you know, UFOs, the phenomenon and and the Nag Hammadi library. So, Darn, we totally like forgot to talk about that. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. I didn't know. I don't know what direction you want to go with that. Okay, so um, well, the Nag Hammadi library. Oh yeah, so that would be something that we'd have to like address. I think in a in another <laughs> session, which we should have because um, yeah, there's a lot. Um, in fact, we could spend like a good long time talking about the Gnostic libraries of you know that were discovered strangely enough also in the 1940s. Um, so, and they changed our understanding of Christianity completely. Um, and, and I was going to put these, the Nag Hammadi library, um, the discovery of these codexes of what are called, what is called Gnostic Christianity, which is a misnomer because you think it's, a, you know, this, this, uh, it's actually, it's a lot of texts that, um, and biblical texts too, and some New Testament texts, as well as some Greek texts. So the important thing I want to talk, I want to say, um, and maybe we can follow this up, um, is that our understanding of the Christians in the first and second century is mostly we don't get taught what they did and, and what kind of communities they were, but they were what I'm going to say it's Hellenistic. They were Hellenistic communities, which means that they were very much like um, the the school of Athens. They were they were they were basically very similar to Plato's communities in the sense that they were young philosophers. So when we see representations of say the apostles, they look like guys in their fifties and whatnot. These were young people. They were between the ages of like thirteen to eighteen years old. And Jesus was was young too. And he was the head, he wasn't that young, but he was, you know, a young guy. And he was the head of like his own, almost like a philosophy school. So we have to reconceive of this idea of the early Christians. Women were engaged in this too. Um, they were there. People literally were following Jesus around and he was disseminating a transmitted knowledge, a Gnostic knowledge um, that then gets reinterpreted to be the Holy Spirit. OK, this idea of this Holy Spirit. Right. What is this? You know, and so um, when we discovered uh, we didn't discover it, but um, when the world discovered these libraries, not just at uh, the Qumran library and the Nag Hammadi library in Egypt, these libraries that had um, that were the bit texts that were the bases of this. Um, these communities of, of Christians that lived out apart from um, society, uh, they were literally doing what Socrates and Plato in the Republic said we should do. We should form these communities around mystical knowledge. Um, and, you know, that's literally what they were doing. So when I do talk about, you know, the allegory of the cave and I say, okay, you know, what's the out? Like in the society when, when we're um, in despair, 
because, you know, things are so unjust, you know, what do we have to, to tell us about this kind of, you know, human condition? This is a human condition. And what we do, we have these texts, but we're never taught about them. Like you're got, not going to le- learn about them in Sunday school. Okay. Yeah. Well, now we have like the internet where you can go online and you could actually, I teach about them in my classes on Christianity. So in my, my classes, I basically just say, okay, you know, this is what you've learned, but this is what was it, it was like. And it makes a lot of those students actually a lot more Christian because they're like, I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know it was like revolutionary and um, something really amazing and life-giving and yeah and there's a reason why Rome killed Jesus because you know he was providing a a a better form of life a new way to live um which you know sadly does happen to people um, who are providing this right so so yes so that's my basic um intro but then you could go through the different texts and then talk about you know Gnosticism but um I hate to say it, but we're at the end of the time because I have yeah, like a, yeah, for sure. <laughs> another um, thing that I have to do, yeah. but I wish I could, we could, we could continue we'll, on this. We will definitely pick that up next time and, you know, we'll arrange that for whenever you're free. Uh, just one more thing is um, what, what do you want the, the book to impart to the readers or something you think that they could walk away with or take away from, from reading encounters? Um, What I wanted to do was I wanted to provide people, especially people who are experiencers, with understanding the variety of people that are experiencers and that they're not alone and that people have thought about this and so that they can think of themselves as part of a community that's actually international and that may not know each other, right? And that there's a there are these ways and strategies to get through this kind of knowledge that they're going through, right? These, these experiences that they're going through and that um, there are helpful ways of, of navigating these experiences. So that was my, my foremost reason for writing it. For sure. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, you know, thank you for writing the book. Uh, It's fantastic. And I, I recommend everybody uh, give it a read or, or listen on the audiobook version And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again sometime soon, Diana. Sounds great. Thanks, James. Take care.